फिफ्थ एनुअल थैंसियर सिंपोजियम में आप सबको खुशाम देंगे मैं हूँ आपका होस्ट बिल्ला इजाज इस वेन्यू के तीन चेयर्स हैं मैम जी मैम सर कहाँ I really like the talk of Abdullah. It was uh, all in Urdu, and it was really nice to listen to it. Uh, and I think, usse aapko ek jo lesson milega wo ye ke when you talk in your own language, uh, you come across as being very natural. Uh, you spend when you go abroad and you work there for ten years, fifteen years, then you start speaking in the same kind of way. in which the locals speak and then you're fine but i think it takes you a bit of time but you you should never be kind of hesitant to use your own language because isse ek to aapko samajh badi achhi aati hai jo aap apna message convey karna cha rahe hain so i was really happy and it was very refreshing to listen to that talk the dusri baat thi wo ye thi ke all the talks that i listened to they were all on prevalence and talking about associations Uh, and all the talks are from department of community community medicine uh, it seems like this department is doing a lot in research but there is a lot of gap you know from other departments so i think that is something which needs to be looked at and can be worked upon uh, also these are all prevalence studies and incidence studies and things on those lines so i think uh, if you want to publish in high quality journals you should be focusing on investigative studies uh, i wouldn't say that you can do randomized trials and things like that but you can still do things which are a bit more investigative which are more mechanistic rather than just looking at uh, the published data and then presenting your results but this is still a very good exercise gives you a lot of experience and also gives you an idea how to publish and how to present so i congratulate all of the presenters you know they did a fantastic job so i'm really happy to listen to all of the talks and i think you must have learned something from everyone uh, so with that uh, i think we'll close the session and i think you have to go somewhere so thank you very much for coming so it's been a while i hope i don't sound nervous all right so my dear classmates as respected audience the honorable panel and the esteemed guests assalamu alaikum i ahmed hasan a fourth year medical undergraduate from batch 4 will present our collective work in the form of a systematic review which was done under the kind supervision of professor dr saira uzul and the consistent consistent support from our very own research officer dr faiza aziz Due to shortage of time, I'll be going over everything quickly. So please stop me anywhere for any kind of clarifications. And as you can see, this presentation is going to be color coded according to the main subheadings of my research article, so that you always know what's going on. So let's just dive in. A very fine title of seven to ten words can only be described by the finer criteria. So keeping in mind the feasibility, the interest, 
the novelty, the ethical, the ethical consideration, and the relevance of ideas. We sought out to study the epi epidemiological basis of a very important medical issue, autism, which is widely known. And if that's not the case, this study is going to make this happen. And this title is indicative of the specific age group and the specific population we targeted. And we wanted to present all this data in, the, in one of the highest forms of evidence, which is a systematic review. So presenting the prevalence of autism in children in Asia, a systematic review. In order to provide a highlight of the crux of this study, here is a structured abstract under the subheadings of background, methods, results, conclusions, and of course the keywords. In this study, we use WHO's definition of autism. As for now, I can define autism as a medical condition that affects the developing brain, resulting in behaviorally defined static malfunctions, which affect language, communication, and uh, imaginative role and social interactions. We adhere to the reporting items, which is the supreme criteria for systematic views, that is PRISMA. We adhere, we adhere to PRISMA, gathered, sought, navigated throughout the literature that was done between 2019 and September 2022. We sought data from all the 48 countries of Asia. We sought out data from all the 48 countries of Asia adhering to PRISMA and targeted the age group of 2 to 12 years. After screening through all this data, we were able to screen out nine articles from eight Asian countries, names of which are Oman, India, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Japan, China, Korea, and Israel. I would like to make it clear that due to methodological heterogeneity, this review is going to be descriptive in nature. All this data was summarized to the best of our abilities, but were not statistically merged. As I said, we targeted the age group of 2 to 12 years, the study sample in different type of studies we included ranged from 1,023 in Saudi Arabia to 1,796,194 in Israel. I'll go into the details of all these results later on. So now I can conclude that the basis of this research was to add to the evidence foundation so that the future policy making can be, can be done so that, uh, that, uh, so that the resources can be allocated to uh, the areas where they are needed the most. So moving on to the introduction, the introduction of this schematic review was done according to, this, uh, according to these main points on the slide right now. And as for now, I have defined autism and uh, presented with you a general idea. So I will tell you what we found in literature. We found in literature the lack of knowledge about autism prevalence in Asia as a lot of work was done in West, so we targeted the Asian countries. And as you can see on the screen in the second passage, in Asia, the overall prevalence of autism was found to be 0.36% and it is still rising. Moving on, very less data was found in uh, only some of the countries of Asia, like in China, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And the authenticity of the, this data was also doubtful. So the uh, gap we found in all this literature that out of all the 48 countries of Asia, only some of the countries had data on uh, prevalence of autism and this data was not systematically merged. There were no surveys done uh, and if there were systematic views present in the literature they were very outdated. So we wanted to summarize all this data so that we can stipulate to the future policy making to allocate the resources where they, where they are needed the most. We believe that the NGOs and the governments can also contribute to these efforts and uh, this study will also help in future. Moving on to the materials and methods, here the definition of autism from WHO which we use. As you can see, autism, also referred to the autism spectrum disorder, constitutes a diverse group of conditions related, related to development of the brain. And this affects three types of predictable patterns, as I mentioned earlier, the communication, the social interaction, and difficulty in speech. The search strategy, adhering to the PRISMA guidelines, we sort out data from four, four electronic databases, which are PubMed, Medline, Hinari, and the Cochrane Library. The studies which were done between 2019 and 2022 were included, and the combination of following terms was used based on the population, diseases, prevalence, or epidemiology. All the data uh, we sought out in the form of the original articles were added to the EndNote software, which is a citation software, and we removed the duplications, and after that we sought out to do the abstract title screening followed by the full text screening. 
The inclusion and exclusion criteria for this study is listed here. The most important factors were the 2 to 12 year age group. We included only the original literature and we used all, uh, only those studies which used WHO's uh, definition of autism. We studied the prevalence and we excluded data on the basis of inadequacy or irrelevance of the results. And only those studies were excluded from which the data cannot be extracted or which were in of other language. After that, after seeking out or screening all the studies, we didn't just include them in our literature. We did the critical appraisal using the UN Average Institute critical appraisal scale. And out of the nine studies we uh, screened, six studies were of very good quality. One was, uh, six studies was of very good quality, one study was of good quality, one was of average, and one study was poor. Regardless of the critical appraisal, all of these nine studies were included in the systematic review. The Uanomist Institute scale can be seen on the screen right now. It basically addresses the risk identification, management, and assessment. Moving on, the PRISMA guideline, uh, the PRISMA flowchart is here. So from all these four databases, we found out 338 articles. After removing the duplications, we were left with 137 articles, which were screened on the basis of abstract and title. Uh, and we were, left with, we were left with only nine studies, and all these studies were included in our review. The data was tabulated and extracted on the basis of uh, uh, different uh, set points we used, uh, which can be seen on the screen right now. It includes the credentials of the authors, the outcome areas, the problems they addressed. And moving on to the most anticipated part of the presentation, the results. As you can see, I am short on time, so I'll just give you the few points. Uh, the prevalence of autism is diverse in different countries, and there is no specific uh, pattern of distribution. As you can see, out of these nine studies, eight countries were included, and in Japan, the prevalence was of uh, highest order. And even in Japan, there, were no, uh, there was no specific area where uh, the prevalence was greater and, uh, than the other. So the prevalence rates have increased, and this otherwise known uh, rare, uh, rare disease has now become a widespread disease. Next, moving on, we have the gender-wise summary of uh, AST prevalence in different countries. In Oman, 3.4 to 1. Boys-girls ratio was found in India, 1.1 to 1. In Japan, 2.2 to 1. And in Korea, 2.7 to 1. Uh, I'll leave this presentation here and move on to the discussion. Uh, this saga of a rare disease, that is autism, which has become a widespread disease now, can be only explained with comparing it to the literature that was done in past. So I would like to highlight that there is scarcity of data, as only nine articles were found from the 48 countries of Asia. There is a need to do studies in all the countries of Asia. The data needs to be updated. There should be regular screening surveys in all the countries of Asia. And as we pointed out in this study, the boys to girls ratio, we already know the risk factors. So we should focus and prevent th this disease. And all this uh, is done in the numerical and figurative way, uh, which is present on the slides. I'm just skipping them for now. And moving on, we use the Vancouver style of referencing. A quick mention of Vancouver style is necessary because one of the main reasons of article ejection is incor incorrect referencing. Referencing is done according to the requirements of the journal in which it is going to be published, and we use Vancouver style for annals of the chemo. Uh, this is a template for original studies, and next we have a template from uh, if, well, if, we, if we are using a web page from internet. In original study, we used this template, which includes the numbering of the references. Uh, followed by the last name initials, then the title of the research article, followed by the journal's name, year, and a very common uh, VIP acronym, volume, issue, and pages. So I will end this slide on a very inquisitive note. Thank you for your patient listening. Question, just one request. I think uh, there are some people talking in the background. If you can just kindly stay a bit silent for another one hour or so, half an hour or so just to show respect to people who are willing to listen and invest their time you know, to do the research. So the next uh, speaker is Dr. Naila Bajwa. Uh, so the time limit is eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Ahmed Hassan. Next presenter is our co-chair, Abdullah Das. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, 
आई विल आई जस्ट ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ बैच टू मैं यहाँ पे अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन प्रेजेंट करने आया हूँ टाइटल एंट्रस्टेबल प्रोफेशनल एक्टिविटीज़ इन मेडिकल स्टूडेंट्स सिस्टमेटिकल रिव्यू हमारे रिव्यू में सबसे बड़ा मसला ये आया था कि किसी को ये नहीं था पता ई पी एस क्या है जिससे भी पूछो तो आप सब किस समझने के लिए बस यही है कि ई पी एस जो है बेसिकली अमेरिकन एसोसिएशन ऑफ मेडिकल कॉलेज है और यू एस एम एल ई एस पैरेंट्स ही सुन सकते हैं उन्होंने तेरह कोर एक्टिविटीज़ सेलेक्ट की थी कि रेजिडेंसी के पहले दिन पर एक डॉक्टर को ये सब करना आना चाहिए एक बहुत लंबी लिस्ट है लेकिन आप चाहें तो बस ये समझ लें कि आपके ख्याल में डॉक्टर को जो भी करना चाहिए हिस्ट्री लेना आना चाहिए फिजिकल एग्जाम परफॉर्म करना आना चाहिए लेकिन कुछ चीज़ें जो कि बंदे के जहन में नहीं आती जिस तरह एक वार्ड से दूसरे वार्ड अगर पेशेंट को भेजना है आपके पास ई का पेशेंट है आप उसको न्यूरो भेजना है तो ये भी एक ई के तौर पर उन्होंने सेलेक्ट किया था तो खैर एबसाइट के ऊपर टाइम मैं वेस्ट नहीं करूँगा क्योंकि टाइम कम है मैं आपसे ये बता दूँगा कि ई पी एस की हमें ज़रूरत क्यों महसूस हुई वो इसलिए क्योंकि नॉर्मली ये है कि ई पी एस जो है उनका इस्तेमाल ग्रेजुएट मेडिकल एजुकेशन के लेवल पर बहुत ज़्यादा हुआ हुआ है लेकिन अंडर ग्रेजुएट लेवल के ऊपर इतना ज़्यादा नहीं हुआ हुआ और इसका ताल्लुक यह है कि ई पी एस जो है वो बेसिकली टाइम बेस्ड एजुकेशन से शिफ्ट करके कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड मेडिकल एजुकेशन के ऊपर एक पैराडाइम शिफ्ट करना था वो ये है कि हमारा जो एनुअल सिस्टम है वो एक टाइम बेस्ड सिस्टम है लेकिन इसके बरस जो दुनिया मूव कर रही है वो है एक कॉम्पिटेंसी बेस्ड आउटकम बेस्ड मेडिकल एजुकेशन की तरफ वो ये कि जब एक बंदे को एक काम करना आ जाए उसके लिए चाहे जितना मर्जी टाइम इस्तेमाल हो जाए उसमें कोई मसला नहीं है वो बार बार रिपीट भी कर सकता है लेकिन लेकिन नॉट एट दी एक्सपेंस ऑफ अ होल ईयर Uh, मैं सिर्फ पेपर का इंट्रोडक्शन देना चाहता हूँ छोटा सा uh, मैं ई आपको डिफ़ाइन कर दिया और मैंने ये भी बता दिया कि जो शिफ्ट uh, है मेडिकल एजुकेशन का वो हम टाइम बेस्ड की तरफ लेके जा रहे हैं ई की मदद से और ये कि ग्रेजुएट लेवल के ऊपर इसके ऊपर काम किया गया अंडर ग्रेजुएट के लेवल के ऊपर इतना काम नहीं किया गया और यही हमारा एम था कि जो थोड़ा बहुत अंडर ग्रेजुएट के लेवल के ऊपर काम किया गया हम उसका सिंथसाइज डेटा कर लें उसको इंटीग्रेट कर लें ताकि फर्दर फ्यूचर रिसर्च को एक डायरेक्शन मिल जाए कि हम आगे से कैसे प्रोसीड करना है जो मेथोडोलॉजी है वो हमारी प्रिज्मा के ऊपर बेस्ड है आ, ये एक ब्लैक प्रिज्मा डायग्राम है रिजल्ट्स में आपको एक फील्ड भी मिल जाएगी जो स्टडी डिज़ाइन था हमारा वो बेसिकली सिस्टमेटिक रिव्यू था ऑब्वियसली जो सर स्ट्रैटी थी वो हमने ये इंटरेस्टेबल प्रोफेशनल एक्टिविटीज़ अंडर ग्रेजुएट मेडिकल स्टूडेंट्स इस तरह की टर्म्स को इस्तेमाल करके और इनसे मिलती जुलती तमाम टर्म्स के ऊपर हमने सर्चिस कंडक्ट कंडक्ट की थी अगस्त के महीने में और सिलेक्शन क्राइटेरिया जो है वो हमारा बेसिकली ये है कि हमने इसमें औरिजिनल रिसर्च सारी इंक्लूड की थी इंग्लिश लैंग्वेज के ऊपर बेस होनी चाहिए थी या फिर उनकी ट्रांसलेशन अवेलेबल होती और नंबर थ्री के उनके ऊपर ईपीएस के तीन एवेन्यूज पे फोकस किया जाता डेवलपमेंट असेसमेंट और इंप्लीमेंटेशन एक्सक्लूडेड वो तमाम आर्टिकल्स थे जो कि अन औरिजिनल थे कॉमेंट्रीज वगैरह और उसके अलावा ये कि जो सिर्फ डिवेलपमेंट ऑफ ई के ऊपर बेस थे हमने उनको भी एक्सक्लूड किया था क्योंकि उनमें ऐसे सपोर्ट करने वाली बातें बहुत कम होती हैं और इसके अलावा छोटी छोटी बातें हैं जिस तरह मेडिकल ग्रेजुएट्स के ऊपर जो रिसर्च थी वो हमने एक्सक्लूड कर दी थी इसके अलावा स्क्रीनिंग की आप खूबसूरत सी एक मेडल की स्क्रीनशॉट देख सकते हैं हमने दो लोगों से को सिलेक्ट किया था कि वो उन तमाम जो आर्टिकल्स हमें से सर्च के तौर पे हमें मिले थे हम उनको उनको स्क्रीन कर लें बीच में दरमियान में ओवरलैप्स और ब्लाइंडिंग का भी हमने एक तरीका इस्तेमाल किया जो कि मुझे फ़कीर हुसैन ने सिखाया था लेकिन वो यहाँ बैठा नहीं हुआ और उसके बाद जो तमाम आर्टिकल्स थे उनके एंड पे जब हमें फाइनल फुल आर्टिकल्स हमने ऑप्टेन किए उनको फिर हमने डाटा एक्सट्रैक्ट कर लिया जिसकी आगे अपना डिटेल्स भी आपको दिखा दूंगा लेकिन ये एक स्क्रीनशॉट दिखाई हुई है ताकि आपको देख के पता लग जाए कि ये जो ये सारा रंगीन जो सारा मामला है ये डाटा एक्सट्रैक्शन टेबल पर तो रिजल्ट हमारे तकरीबन थ्री फिफ्टी सर्च रिजल्ट आए थे जिनको कि हमने स्क्रीन किया तो एंड पे फिफ्टी रिजल्ट रह गए थे जिनको कि हमने फिर बाद में एक्सट्रैक्ट किया डेटा एक्सट्रैक्ट किया और फिर डेटा एक्सट्रैक्शन के बाद फाइनल थर्टी सेवन आर्टिकल्स हमने अपने रिव्यू में इंक्लूड किए थे स्टडी करेक्टरिस्टिक्स नंबर वन ऑब्वियसली नेम्स ऑफ ऑथर्स नंबर टू इयर्स ऑफ पब्लिकेशन जो प्री कोविड ईयर्स थे उन उनके रिसर्च आर्टिकल ज़्यादा प्रेवलेंट थे 2018 और 2019 के नंबर थ्री जो कंट्रीज ऑफ ओरिजिन थी सबसे ज़्यादा यूएसए के साथ थी यूएसए से थी और फिर उसके बाद जर्मनी में थी और फिर उसके बाद स्विट्जरलैंड इंडिया मैक्सिको कैनेडा भी उसके बाद स्टडी डिज़ाइन आप देख सकते हैं बहुत ज़्यादा थे जो सबसे ज़्यादा फ्रीकुंट स्टडी डिज़ाइन था वो था लॉन्गिट्यूडनल स्टडीज़ का लेकिन जो सबसे पर्सनल ओपिनियन है लेकिन जो सबसे यूज़फुल थे वो पायलट स्टडीज़ थे उसके बाद ये है कि मेन फोकस डेवलपमेंट के ऊपर 11 आर्टिकल्स ने कमेंट किया था इंप्लीमेंटेशन के ऊपर 21 ने असेसमेंट के ऊपर 18 ने और
اس کے بعد یہ خوبصورت سا یہ پائی چارٹ ہے جو میں نے بیسٹ بنایا تھا کہ کون کون سے ای پی ایس کتنے کتنے ڈسکس کیے گئے تھے ای پی ایس ون ٹو سکس اور ٹین سب سے زیادہ ڈسکس کیے تھے ایک ڈاکٹر کو سب سے زیادہ یہ چیز آنی چاہیے ہسٹری لینا اپنا فزیکل ایگزام پرفارم کرنا پریزنٹ کرنا کیس اپنا اور یہ بتانا کہ یہ پیشنٹ ابھی ایمرجنسی ٹریٹمنٹ کا حق دار ہے کہ نہیں اس کے بعد تین جو ایونیوز تھے میں ان کے اوپر کامنٹ کروں گا بریفلی ڈیولپمنٹ اسسمنٹ اور ڈیولپمنٹ امپلیمنٹیشن اور اسسمنٹ جو ڈیولپمنٹ ہے اس میں ہم نے دو چیزیں دیکھیں کچھ آرٹیکلس نے ای پی ایس ڈیولپ کیے ہوئے تھے اور کچھ آرٹیکلس نے کریکولر ڈیولپ کیے ہوئے تھے جن جو کہ ای پی اے کے اوپر بیس تھے جو ای جو ای پی اے ڈیولپ کیے گئے تھے ان میں کچھ اسپیشلٹیز انوالو تھیں آپ دیکھ سکتے ہیں انٹرنل میڈیسن ایمرجنسی میڈیسن گائنی آپس تھیں اپنا جنرل میڈیسن اور جنرل سرجری جو میتھڈ یوز فار ای پی اے ڈیولپمنٹ ان کا کرکس یہ ہے کہ انہوں نے بس یہ دیکھا کہ ایک جو مائل اسٹون ہے وہ کیا ہے کہ ڈاکٹر کو پیشنٹ دیکھنا آنا چاہیے اس کو بتانا آنا چاہیے کہ اس کو ہوا کیا ہے پیشنٹ کو بتانا آنا چاہیے کہ تمہیں ہوا کیا ہے اور پھر اس کے آگے سے فردر سے بتانا کہ اب تم نے کیا کرنا ہے تو اس کے اوپر یہ تھا کہ کور ڈومینس ڈرا کرنا اور پھر اس کے ساتھ جو ایکسپرٹس تھے انہوں نے لٹریچر ریویو کیا تھا کافی زیادہ کہ ان کے نزدیک کیا چیزیں امپورٹنٹ تھیں اس لحاظ سے انہوں نے یہ ای پی ایس سارے میپ آؤٹ کیے تھے جو کہ میں نے آپ کو پہلے بتایا ہے اس کے بعد جو کریکولر ڈیولپمنٹ کریکولم ڈیولپمنٹ تھا اس میں بیسیکلی دو باتیں تھیں ورک شپ ورک شاپس اور فارمولیشن آف ماڈلس جو ورک شاپ ان دونوں میں نارملی جو پاپولیشن ایز سچ وہ ایکسپرٹس کے اوپر بیس تھیں وہ میڈیکل اسٹوڈنٹس کے اوپر بیس تھیں کیونکہ آبویسلی ہمیں نہیں پتا کہ ہم نے بھی کیا کرنا ہے ہمیں سکھایا جانا ہے اور پھر اس کے ارد گرد ہم نے پھر کریکولم ڈیولپ کیا تھا اس کے بعد ای پی اے امپلیمنٹیشن جو ہے اب وہ ایک سبجیکٹو یہ اگلی دو باتیں بہت زیادہ سبجیکٹو ہیں جو امپلیمنٹیشن ہے وہ یہ تھا کہ انہوں نے آپ کو سکھانا کیسے ہے کافی زیادہ انسٹیٹیوٹ اسپیسیفک اسٹریٹجیز تھیں جو سب سے زیادہ فریکوینٹ اسٹریٹجی تھی وہ آپ درمیان میں دیکھ سکتے ہیں سیمولیشن بیسڈ ٹریننگ تھی یہ کہ لائک آپ کے سامنے بیسیکلی ایک رول پلے قسم کا کہ ڈاکٹر جائے گا اس نے پیشنٹ کے ساتھ کیسے ڈیل کرنا ہے اور پھر اس کے علاوہ یہ کہ زیادہ تر نے یہی کیا تھا کہ انہوں نے ای پی ایس پری ایگزٹنگ کریکولا کے اندر ہی لائک لٹریچر کے طور پہ ہی انٹروڈیوس کرا دیے تھے ایز سلیبس اس کے علاوہ یہ کچھ اسٹیٹسٹکس تھے جو کہ ہمارے امپلیمنٹیشن ماڈلس میں ہمیں ملے تھے اس کے مطابق جو کہ نائنٹی فائیو پرسینٹ جو اسٹڈیز تھیں ان میں پازیٹیو آؤٹ کمس تھے جن میں کہ سیونٹی سیون پرسینٹ جو تھیں ان میں اسٹیٹسٹکس انوالو کیے ہوئے تھے تو وہ پازیٹیولی سگنیفکینٹ تھے اس کے بعد اسسمنٹ کی باری ہے اب اسسمنٹ پہ اٹھارہ آرٹیکلس نے کامنٹ کیا تھا اور اس میں دو باتیں ہیں کہ ایک تو میتھڈ کون سا ہے اور دوسرا اسکیل کون سا استعمال کر رہے ہیں کہ انہوں نے مارکنگ کس طرح سے کرنی ہے آپ لوگوں کی میتھڈس کافی تھے ورک پلیس بیس اسسمنٹس تھیں کہ یعنی کہ وار بیسیکلی یہ سارے ڈفرینٹ ٹائپس آف وارڈ ٹیسٹ ہیں میں آپ کو ویسے ہی بتا دیتا ہوں اور اس کے علاوہ تین تین مین اسکیلس تھے اوتاوا چین اور اس کے علاوہ لائکرڈ بیسڈ سسٹمس تھے یعنی کہ پوائنٹ بیسڈ سسٹمس تھے اوتاوا کے آپ دیکھ سکتے ہیں ایک اسٹڈی نے ماڈیفائڈ اوتاوا بھی استعمال کیا تھا باقی ایز سچ رپورٹیبل چیزیں نہیں تھیں پھر اس کے بعد کنفیوژن پہ آتے ہیں سب سے بات پہلی بات یہ کہ جو سب سے فریکوینٹلی ڈسکس ایونیو تھا وہ امپلیمنٹیشن کا تھا جو ای پی ایس ون ٹو سکس اور ٹینتھ جو کہ میں بتا چکا ہوں وہ موسٹ فریکوینٹلی امپلیمنٹیڈ اور ٹیسٹڈ تھے اس کے علاوہ ڈیولپمنٹ اور اسپیشلٹی اسپیسیفک ای پی ایس جو تھیں وہ ایک چیلنج کے طور پہ ایکسپرٹس کو فیس کرنا پڑا تھا لیکن ضروری بھی یہی تھا کیونکہ آفٹر آل ہم نے انڈر گریجویٹ کریکولم ڈیولپمنٹ ڈیولپ کرنا ہے تو اس کے لیے آپ ضروری یہ یہ بات ضروری ہے کہ آپ صرف ان گور ای پی ایس کے اوپر نامنحصر ہیں جو کہ اے اے ایم سی نے پرپوز کی ہے اس کے بعد دوسری بات یہ ہے کہ امپلیمنٹیشن بائی ماڈیفائنگ ایگزٹنگ کریکولر جو تھی وہ زیادہ سب سے زیادہ پرابلنٹ یہی طریقہ تھا اسسمنٹ کے لیے انہوں نے موسٹ ریلائٹ موسٹلی پری ایگزٹنگ اسکیلس کے اوپر ریلائی کیا تھا اپنے اسکیلز انہوں نے کم بنائے تھے اور پھر اس کے بعد یہ ہے کہ ریلائبلٹی اور فیزیبلٹی کے اوپر اتنا کامنٹ نہیں تھا انہوں نے دیا اور میں نے آپ کو شاید یاد ہو میں نے ابھی کنٹریز ڈسکس کی تھیں کہ یو ایس اے اور جرمنی میں سب سے زیادہ ریزلٹس ہمیں ملے تھے اس کے علاوہ باقی کنٹریز سے ایسے ریزلٹس بھی اتنے نہیں تھے ملے اس کے آگے سے ہم لمیٹیشن سے بات کر لیں گے یہ کچھ کامنٹس ہیں سپروائزنگ کلینیشنز اور کریکولم لیڈرس کے لیے ان کا کرکس یہ ہے کہ ہم اس ریویو سے ہم چاہتے ہیں کہ ان کو بس یہ اندازہ ہو جائے کہ جو جو گول ہے اسٹوڈنٹس کے لیے فیکلٹی کے لیے اسٹوڈنٹس کی طرف وہ یہ ہے کہ ان کو بس انٹرسٹمنٹ سکھائی جائے ان کو رسپانسبلٹیز سے ایکسپوز کیا جائے تاکہ ان کو زیادہ سیکھنے کو حاصل ہو پہلی بات یہ اور دوسری بات یہ کہ ٹیکنالوجی کا استعمال زیادہ کیا جائے
दूसरी बात ये कि हाई कंट्री स्पेसिफिटी थी स्पेसिफिसिटी थी यू और जर्मनी के अलावा बाकी कंट्रीज़ की रिप्रेजेंटेशन बहुत कम थी लैक ऑफ कंट्रोल ट्रायल्स था सिर्फ एक आर था हमारी स्टडी में उसके अलावा बाकी सब बेसिकली क्रॉस सेक्शनल थे कोहॉर्ट्स थे लॉन्ग जर्नल थे सब और दो डेटा बेसिस हमने इस्तेमाल किए थे गूगल गूगल स्कॉलर और पबमेंट और लास्टली बस फ्यूचर प्रॉस्पेक्ट्स पे कमेंट ये है कि फिजिबिलिटी एविडेंस इम्प्लीमेंटेशन मॉडल्स के ऊपर काम है और रिलायबिलिटी का एनालिसिस असेसमेंट मॉडल्स के ऊपर बहुत काम है जिसके ऊपर के काम किया जा सकता है और तीसरी बात यह कि दूसरी कंट्रीज़ के ऊपर भी रिप्रजेंट की रिप्रजेंटेशन भी ज़्यादा होनी चाहिए और लास्टली ये कि जो ग्रेजुएट लेवल पर जो काम हुआ है उसका इस्तेमाल करके तो फर्दर रिसर्च को गाइड किया जा सके एंडिंग नोट में मैं बस ये कहना चाहूँगा कि आप सबका यही काम है कि आप जल्दी से अपने यू एस एम एल ईज प्लैब्स और यू के एम एल ईज़ करें बाहर जाएँ इनके ऊपर औरिजिनल स्टडीज़ करें ताकि पाकिस्तानी स्टूडेंट्स के ऊपर रिव्यूज़ लिख सकें थैंक यू ब्रिलियन प्रेजेंटेशन बाय Assalamu alaikum I am Bisal Nasir a fourth year MBBS student so the research which I am going to present today is quality of life in alzheimer's dementia and its care giving in southeast asia and it's a systematic review now moving on to introduction uh, alzheimer's disease is basically a brain disorder that deteriorates the memory cognition behavior and eventually the ability of the patients to perform the daily tasks Now Alzheimer's disease is one of the most burdensome uh, disease for the older people and over 60 million people are living with it as of 2020 Now why the quality of life maintenance is important in these patients Basically quality of life not only tells that whether the treatment which is giving to the patients is efficacious or not but it's also a very political issue because uh, quality of life tells us whether a country is uh, having full budget for the costs that are directed towards the patients of alzheimer's dementia quality of life basically involves both the objective elements as well as the subjective elements and the care giving in the patients of alzheimer's dementia is very important uh, because they are not able to perform the activities of their daily life so it becomes very necessary to also pay attention to the quality of life of their caregivers now regarding southeast asia the prevalence of alzheimer's disease here is about 59.8% and it's further increasing but the main point of concern today is that there is very limited data available uh, in this region regarding what methods they are using for the assessment of quality of life and also the care giving is found to be lacking in this region now the aims of my study are to identify different scales and questionnaires that have been used for the assessment of quality of life in these patients and what are the different factors that either positively or negatively influence their quality of life and at the end to assess the care giving of these patients in this region now starting with the methods i will move uh, to the prisma flow diagram uh, first of all uh, we use the prisma checklist and uh, the total studies which we found were 17871 and after screening the reports based on the title and abstract we obtain only 36 studies and out of which uh, the six studies were not having the full text so in our uh, systematic review only 18 studies are included the inclusion criteria of our research was that uh, the patients must have a diagnosis of alzheimer's dementia and studies must use a validated tool for its assessment and the studies which describe the care giving uh, in these patients were also included now we didn't uh, include the rcts which assess the efficacy of uh, different drugs Uh, for improvement of the quality of life now this is a table which is showing the basic characteristics of our studies uh, it was the main mean age of our patients uh, was found to be 75 years and uh, most of the patients of alzheimer's dementia were female and uh, uh, previous literature also supports this, this. 
Now, the main skills which were used for assessment of quality of life in these patients uh, are as follows. The QOL AD scale uh, is most frequently used and it has also been adapted in Malay and Thai languages while WHO QOL and the Euro QOL scale were also used. Severity of dementia was assessed by using three scales, mini mental state examination as well as DAD and NPI. While uh, for the assessment of quality of life of caregivers, uh, WHO quality of life B version was mostly used. Now, uh, a point uh, that arises is that the patients rate their quality of life higher as compared to the caregivers and the patient's educational level, severity of neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, basically cause this discrepancy. Now, what are the different factors which affect the quality of life of patients of Alzheimer's dementia? There are mainly five basic factors. First is the quality of life of caregivers and a positive correlation is found between the quality of life of the caregivers as well as quality of life of the patients. And caregiving by spouse specifically uh, leads to good quality of life. While as the disease becomes more severe, the quality of life of patients declines and uh, the level of cognitive impairment in these patients is a major predictor of poor quality of life. While medication adherence status is found to be poor in these patients mainly uh, because of forgetfulness or uh, they feel difficulty in taking the medicine and the overall prevalence was found to be 69.2 percent and the patients who had adherence were found to have a good quality of life while a satisfaction of relationship with children friends relatives as well as the level of social activities also improve their quality of life now Moving on to the quality of life of caregivers of these patients, uh, the mean quality of life of the patient's uh, caregiver was found to be very low as compared to other diseases. Now the caregiver's quality of life was affected mainly by the age, their sex, their level of education and level of strain and the family and the social support that was available. Now the burden of care and psychological strain are negatively related to their quality of life. While it is found that if the caregivers uh, adopt different coping strategies like approach coping or passive appraisal, then it has a good effect on their quality of life. Now, uh, giving an overall uh, view of the caregiving facilities which are available in this region, it was found that the diagnosis of dementia was mostly by chance when the patients were visiting the general physicians and uh, the costly pharmacological treatment had a negative influence on the preference of uh, the family of patients whether to take the medicine or not. And uh, the awareness was uh, found to be lacking uh, in most of the regions, but Philippines, Singapore and Thailand showed to have greater level of awareness. And uh, the dementia care services, although they are improving, but uh, they are still lacking basically in the rural areas and uh, the burden of caregiving uh, increases uh, if the patient is very old and uh, with severe stage of disease or if the caregiver is a female. Now um, the main points of discussion are that the most commonly used scale for assessment was quality of life, AD. And it's a very convenient scale, 13 item, and its main uh, benefit is that it can be completed in just 5 to 10 minutes. And uh, Euro quality of life was other scale used, but it is not specific for the dementia. Uh, so the main theme is that uh, different scales uh, assess different domains in these patients, but usage of more than one domains uh, can lead to the time uh, type 1 errors. And secondly, uh, literature has showed that uh, the person-centered care interventions decrease the agitation, neuropsychiatric symptoms and depression in these patients, so more social support should be available for the caregivers. And uh, infrastructure and workforce capacity for the dementia care provision is found to be insufficient in Malaysia while data from the other regions is still lacking and uh, we don't know uh, while the caregiving is up to the mark or not. 
Now, uh, moving to the future directions, uh, there still exists a gap uh, in research that is mostly related to the quality of life uh, in different stages of dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, as well as more aspects of physical, environmental and social domains uh, should also be uh, evaluated. So more investment in the dementia care provision should be uh, done in this region so that patients are detected in early uh, stage of the disease. So the costs can also be reduced in that way. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am Dr. Muhammad West, postgraduate resident of FCPS Community Medicine in King Edward Medical University and I am doing my training under the supervision of Professor Dr. Sair Afzal. Today I am going to present my research article whose title is Prevalence of Alzheimer's Disease in Geriatric Population, a Systematic Review. First of all, its introduction. The term Alzheimer's disease has been in use since 1907 when a first case report of Alzheimer's disease was reported for the psychiatric symptoms of a 51-year-old woman who was experiencing difficulty in understanding forgetfulness, disorientation and strange behavior. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive clinical syndrome ranging from mild memory decline to loss of person's ability to carry out daily routine activities due to neuropathological changes in brain that can affect cognition, speech, language, behavior, video special orientation, motor system and personality. Alzheimer's disease is the most common uh, is more common in elderly people above the age of 65 years. However, it can also affect younger people in which it is called young onset Alzheimer's disease. Age is the strongest risk factor of Alzheimer's disease, but it is not a normal part of aging. Alzheimer's dementia is the most common form of dementia and it accounts for 60 to 80 percent of all forms of dementia. It is the fifth leading cause of death in USA in people above the age of 65 years. According to WHO, the total share of people above the age of 60 years in 2019 was 1 billion and it is expected to double by the year 2050. Due to this rapid increase in elderly population, the burden of Alzheimer's disease is also increasing at high rate. A lot of resources will be needed for the care giving of patients suffering from dementia. Therefore, Alzheimer's disease will continue to impose a great socio-economic burden to the governments as well as their families for the care giving of patients. In 2015, the global estimated cost for dementia was $957 billion and it will be $2.54 trillion by the year 2030 and it will rise to $9 trillion by the year 2050. Now what are the objectives of this study? We conducted this systematic review to find out and update our knowledge regarding the current global prevalence of dementia due to Alzheimer's disease in geriatric population. And in our study, we defined the geriatric population as aged 65 years and over. Now the methodology. Prefer reporting items for systematic and uh, systematic review and meta analysis. Prisma checklist 2020 was used. We searched Google Scholar, PubMed, and PubMedinet databases. Our searches uh, were restricted to the years from January uh, 2010 to October 2022, and our research was conducted on 19 of November 2022. The keywords and Boolean operators used are Alzheimer's disease, or dementia, and prevalence and geriatric population. With our search strategy, we identified 252 articles from the databases and after removing the 16 duplicates, 236 uh, articles were screened on the basis of their titles and abstracts. And after excluding 131 articles on the basis of uh, titles and abstracts that are systematic review, meta-analysis, review, editorials, commentaries, case control studies, experimental studies, case sports and case series. 105 studies were left behind and then they are sought for the full text review. Four articles have not found for their uh, full text and then the 101 studies are assessed for eligibility. 81 studies has been excluded from our systematic review. The reasons are the articles that are focusing on the risk factor causes, diagnosis, treatment, complications, incidence, dependency and quality of life are excluded. Non-population based studies are also excluded. Articles that focus on young onset Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia or dementia as a whole are excluded. Those studies in which 
the prevalence of alzheimer disease cannot be estimated or excluded and the those articles whose language are other than english are excluded and at the end 20 studies are included in our systematic review whose reports are included in our study the characteristics of the studies included in our study includes the author's name and publication year their study design the country and the region where the study is conducted the age range of the samples that are studied the diagnostic criteria used in each study the years of data collection and the groups whether they are males females urban rural are included and then the number of the diagnosed patients of alzheimer disease and at the end are the prevalence of alzheimer disease of these 20 studies seven are from asia five five are from africa and europe two from australia and one from america from all these 20 studies are total of 21 million Individuals were included for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Highest numbers were reported in one study that is conducted in USA and lowest numbers are reported from a study that is conducted in Torres State. The age of the individual in one study was 45 to 93 years and in three studies the age of the individuals were uh, equal to or greater than 50 years while in one study the age of the individuals were 55 to 79 years and in one study the age of the individuals are greater than 55 years and in five studies the age of the individual are greater than 60 years and in eight studies the age of the individuals are greater than or equal to 65 years and in one study the age of the individuals are 68 years the diagnostic criteria that are used in most of the studies are NINCDS ADRDA that is National Institute of Neurological and Communicative Disease and Stroke Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Association the eight articles have used this diagnostic criteria. There are also other diagnostic criteria that are used in these studies. They are listed below. And our results shows that uh, lowest prevalence was found in one study that is conducted in Al Qaghara district of the Egypt that comes out to be 0.97%. While the study that is conducted in Israel showed that the prevalence of uh, Alzheimer's disease in Israel is 9.8%. The pool prevalence calculated in our study comes out to be 6.25%. Discussion. The pool prevalence of Alzheimer's disease estimated from our study is lower than the study conducted in USA by B.L. Plasman et al., which quote published in 2007, which showed prevalence of Alzheimer's disease to be 9.7%. This may be due to the fact that the sample age was greater than 71 years and the sample had already evaluated for a comprehensive in-home assessment for dementia and researchers used this data to find out prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. A study conducted in Korea showed prevalence of Alzheimer's disease of 4.8% in 2008. The sample age in this study was greater than 65 years and the diagnostic criteria used was NINCDS ADRDA. The heterogeneity in the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease may be due to the methodological issues which include sampling methods, age as well as sex of the participants, screening procedures, rural urban distribution and diagnostic criteria. Conclusion. The genetic population is increasing due to better health facilities and advancements in medical knowledge. Likewise, the number of problems in genetic populations such as Alzheimer's disease are also increasing. So greater focus is needed to be given in epidemiology of Alzheimer's disease so that optimum care should be allocated. The study is subject to many limitations due to large heterogeneity in literature and insufficient reporting data. So, in view of the above, it is recommended to conduct epidemiological studies regarding to estimate the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease so that optimum level of care should be provided to the patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Thank you.
Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Meha Siddiqui, PGI from Community Medicine Department, King Edward Medical University. Uh, today, the topic of my presentation is prevalence and association of anthropometric indices of growth with vaccination status of children under five years of age, systematic review and meta-analysis. These are the li uh, learning outlines of my presentation. Introduction. Uh, retarded child growth is a public health problem in many developing countries, especially in Asian and African regions. And growth of a child is a sensitive and readily measurable indicator of health status of children under five years of age. So consistent and accurate anthropometric assessment of children thus helps in early identification and timely interventions for emerging health issues. It was highlighted by UNICEF that infectious diseases contribute to poor anthropometric outcome, uh, outcomes because uh, it causes uh, uh, reduced dietary intake, increased nutrient loss and increased nutrient requirements leading to a poor growth of a child. So the most uh, cost effective health intervention that is childhood immunization reduces the incidence and duration of infectious diseases leading to improved child growth. Uh, the objectives of my systematic review are to determine the prevalence of uh, anthropometric indices of growth in vaccinated and non-vaccinated children under 5 years of age, to determine the association of anthropometric indices of growth with vaccination status of children under 5 years of age. Uh, operational definitions. Uh, so uh, vaccination status, a child is said to be vaccinated who gets at least one dose of BCG, three doses of DPT, three doses of po polio vaccine and one dose of measles vaccine. Anthropometric outcomes. Growth of a child is evaluated using the anthropometric indices, weight for height, height for age and weight for age of the WHO standards. And according to WHO standard, any child with height for age, weight for age or weight for height z-score below minus 2 standard deviation are considered as stunted, underweight and wasted respectively by taking age and sex into consideration. So in my review, stunted, underweight and wasted are taken as anthropometric outcomes. Methods. We followed the recommendations of the PRISMA for an extensive literature review. Uh, search strategy, a literature search was done using mesh keywords with Boolean operators on Google Scholar, PubMed, PubMedinet, Medline in June 2021 and full text of relevant articles were identified to be included in the review. Study eligibility criteria, inclusion criteria, articles reporting effect of vaccination on anthropometric outcomes in children less than 5 years of age were included. Gray literature and published articles on relevant data were included. Exclusion criteria, articles that include an incomplete reporting of outcomes were excluded and articles written in non-English language were excluded. So this is the plus, uh, Prisma flow, uh, flow sheet. Uh, according to it, that um, the records were identified through PubMed and Google Scholar were 280 and after going through screening and applying eligibility criteria, the final, uh, finally uh, stu uh, studies included in my systematic review were 13. Data extraction and synthesis. Data were extracted from the final selected articles to a table containing um, information such as author name, uh, country uh, where study was conducted, sample size, study design, vaccination status, and frequency of stunting, wasting, and underweight. So this is the snapshot of that table. Uh, statistical analysis. Data was arranged from different studies with number of wasted, stunted, and underweight children for vaccinated and non-vaccinated children, and results were incorporated in open meta-analysis version of this software, and meta-analysis was performed using random effect model, and estimates were presented with odds ratio by using 95% confidence interval. And the p-value less than 0 0.05 was considered significant for this study. And forest plots were used to assess the pooled estimates in corresponding 95% confidence interval for each study. So this is a table showing results, that is pooled prevalence of stunting, underweight and wasting in vaccinated and non-vaccinated children under 5 years of age. Here we can see that 36.6% of vaccinated children were found stunted, while 43% of non-vaccinated children were found stunted. 16.3% uh, uh, of vaccinated children were found underweight and 23% of non-vaccinated children were found underweight. And 5.4% of vaccinated children were wasted and 8% of non-vaccinated children were wasted. So this is the bar chart showing uh, the pool prevalences of stunting in vaccinated and non-vaccinated group. And here we can very well appreciate the difference in prevalence 
of stuntic uh, that is there more uh, frequency of stunted children in non vaccinated group likewise this uh, bar chart shows the pool prevalence of underweight in vaccinated and non vaccinated group and this is for wasting now uh, this is the forest plot it represent estimates of odds ratio for stunting among non vaccinated children uh, which is found to be 1.46 as compared to vaccinated children it means that those who are non vaccinated children they are uh, 1.46 times more at risk of developing stunting than vaccinated children and this is the forest plot representing uh, odds ratio for underweight which is 0.98 among non vaccinated children and again this is the forest plot representing odds ratio for wasted among non wasted child vaccinated children which is found to be 1.443 now discussion uh, the present review summarizes the prevalence of stunting underweight and wasting in vaccinated and non vaccinated children to show the effect of vaccination on anthropometric outcomes of children and in our study the pool prevalence of stunting was found to be 36% vaccinated children and if we compare with uh, the records uh, that were retrieved from the developing countries like in india and africa it was 43 and 50% respectively which is very high and in developed countries where access to vaccination and uh, awareness on vaccination is high their uh, prevalence is very low as low as 1.8% uh, kyle and 7% in brazil again the pool prevalence of underweight was found to be 16.3 in vaccinated children in our study and again uh, if we compare with the developing countries it is very low and if we compare with the developed countries it is uh, very high so same is the case with wasting and a significant association was found between all anthropometric indices of growth and vaccination status of children and these findings are consistent with the previous studies as in india study was done to examine the effect of childhood vaccination program on growth of children less than 4 years of age and it was found that it caused a 22 to 25% decrease in the uh, stunting and 15% reduction in underweight of an average child limitations uh in my review three and anthropometric indices that is height for age weight for age and weight for height are used in the review other indices are not taken due to non availability of the relevant data although the use of mid upper arm circumference has been found as a more reliable means of measuring growth of a child than other ones conclusion childhood vaccination leads to improved growth in terms of height and weight specific for age and sex in a setting where most of the children have low anthropometric parameters according to who childhood standards Childhood vaccination coverage being a major intervention for decreasing child mortality and morbidity can be considered a potential tool for solving the problems of poor growth in developing countries. So um, we can see that childhood vaccination programs they are um, high return investment investment because uh, they provide uh, long term benefits as they not only prevent childhood infections. but also protects growth and development educational achievements and future earnings and productivity so these are the references and thank you assalamu alaikum everyone uh, bismillahir rahmanir rahim uh, i welcome all of you uh, to this uh, bright spark session of uh, king edward annual symposium um as you all know that i'm a kemcolian i graduated in 2003 and i think it's really refreshing and encouraging to see that all of you have got huge interest in research and i can see by the number of people sitting in the audience today so before uh or without me taking too much time going into the details of you know about research and all the benefits of research i think we should just stick with the schedule and we should begin by uh, inviting the first speaker which happens to be my class fellow dr zainab so dr zainab uh, will talk about gp training and service delivery in the uk so once the presentation is uploaded uh, she will begin i think the timeline that we have here is about uh, is it 20 minutes for each Uh, 15 minutes so i think we'll try to stick with that uh, time right okay see okay. you thank you uh, assalam alaikum everyone uh, as uh, dr umar has said i'm also a kemcolian aur mera khali ye introduction hi kafi hai ki main ki class se lehu because he is such a decorated doctor and uh, a renowned researcher 
तो हम तो तेरे नाम नहीं हो सके लेकिन आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अ लिटिल बिट अबाउट प्राइमरी केयर जीबी ट्रेनिंग इन यूके एंड सर्विस डिलीवरी इन द यूके सॉरी देयर इज अ बिट ऑफ अ ग्लिच एंड माय प्रेजेंटेशन इज नॉट हियर यू जस्ट बेयर विद मी फॉर अ मिनट एंड आई विल स्टार्ट इट थ्री टू एट नाइन जीरो एट एस वन टी ओ एस वी ओ एस वी पासवर्ड क्या इसका So what we are going to talk about today is uh, what is general practice, uh, pros and cons of general pra- doing general practice in England. We are going to talk about GP training or uh, how to become a primary care physician in England, and we are going to talk about. Sorry, I think. And we are going to talk about service delivery in the UK. Uh, so first of all. Talking about general practice, uh, this is it. Yeah. Gee, so finally we got the presentation and we'll start now. Yes. So as I said we're going to talk about what is primary care, general practice, uh what does it mean in in UK, pros and cons of doing general practice, uh GP training in the UK and service delivery. So by ser- service delivery I mean how how do GP uh practice uh how do GP practices work in England? So what is general practice? Uh, I've tried to create a health pyramid here. I have tweaked it a little bit from uh, from the standard one. I think at the base are uh, uh, preventive services, health promotion, disease prevention, and community care. Here comes the role of public health, making policies, uh, cascading instructions. Then is primary health care, and the tip of the iceberg is secondary and tertiary care. So what I would say is, for the purpose of UK. i would combine primary health care with clinical preventive services health promotion and community care because we believe that as family physicians every contact with a patient is an opportunity for health promotion and disease prevention so if you look at the pyramid and you combine primary health care with community care that we are providing in community plus the uh, plus other resources like pharmacies district health nurses palliative care and you include the preventive services and health promotion primary care makes the bulk of healthcare system in england almost 90% of the consultations that are done with patients are done in primary care and 8 to 10% in secondary and tertiary care so i uh, this i've taken this from nhs england's website our people means gps or primary care physicians are meeting the challenges of a growing and aging population with the next generation of proactive preventative healthcare education advice and treatment we want to give patients earlier diagnosis and more lifelong control over staying well their way i think this bit their way is very important because general practice is quite patient centered we make decisions along with our patients we basically educate them we calibrate them and then we leave the decisions pretty much with them and that's what our job is gps and practice teams provide vital services for the patients they are at the heart of a uh, heart of our communities the foundation of the nhs so as i said bulk of uk doctor consultations 90% of the consultations take place in primary care i'd say general practice is the gateway of the nhs and we are the gatekeepers of nhs uh, a lot of the times we uh, we take we bear the brunt of it and prevent really nhs from collapsing or crashing really so in terms of uh, the the designation of the names used you can say gp or general practitioner is the common one in in, in uk family physicians uh, perhaps uh, commoner in, in in northern america canada and uh, usa 
consultant generalist perhaps an emerging term because in certain countries it is considered more prestigious to be a consultant so i think i'd say that uh, we are consultants in terms of being journalists seeing each and every patient with uh, different medical conditions so this bit gp surgeries are independent businesses they're not like hospitals not like trusts i'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about it when we go down uh, to the service delivery in the uk yeah so pros of general practice i think flexibility it is very flexible and flexible in in different dimensions for example if you want to work weekdays you can work monday to friday if you want to work three days two days that's also fine if you prefer working nights you can work in emergency gp services and just do nights if you want to do weekends you can work weekends so basically there's a lot of flexibility you can work as much as you want and you can work as less as it suits you then there is flexibility in the other dimension you can be a full time gp just seeing patients if you like health economics you like management uh, you like uh, management administration you can be a partner and do a lot of administrative work you can get involved in management in your practice going above the practice level at uh, with pcns primary care networks so you are involved with neighboring practices in terms of management you can go above that if you want in terms of management then if you like to teach and train you can uh, work in general practice and see patients two to three days and then train uh, medical students and gp registrars so you can be a portfolio gp you can have a substantive post or you can work as locum there is a lot of flexibility up to the extent that i have moved back to pakistan a year ago i can just go back uh, as and when i want as long as i'm uh, doing my appraisals and uh, maintaining my registration and work there which makes it i think there is uh, flexibility with being a hospital consultant but not as much as with being a gp range of medicine uh, if you like to see a soft different patients you uh, one day you want to see a patient with cardiovascular problem they can walk through your door with something as simple as olecranon bursitis or they might be walking in with an mi so i think this uh, wide range of medicine if you want to see different patients if you like this challenge of dealing with uncertain conditions uh, general practice is your forte so continuity of care because we see patients or uh, long term so we build that relationship with the local population uh it it is actually it never uh, it has never ceased to surprise me that we refer patients to secondary care they get a diagnosis this, they start their treatment if if they need to in in, in the hospitals and they come back and actually recheck uh, or uh, discuss things with us which is which is quite uh, amazing really if you have that kind of uh, relationship and uh, sort of mutual trust uh, with your patients you can choose your working time again flexibility you can work mornings if your children and you want to come home by 2 o'clock you can do that if afternoons or evenings suit you better that you can do that you've plenty of time to do other things you can tweak things if you like music if you like poetry reading gardening anything there's there's a lot that you can do if you want to travel uh, if you want to so sort of give more time to your family at uh, some point in your life it's 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 very flexible i think cons of channel practice downside i think a lot of them are perceived and i put some question marks uh, some people if they argue that okay we'll miss acute work in channel practice there'll be a lot of chronic conditions or stable patients coming in i think we see uh, up to certain extent some amount of acute work a pe might walk in through your room a breathless patient it could be sepsis it could be mi but yes if you like a lot of acute work like if you want to deal with major trauma if you want to be putting chest drains in if you want to do tracheostomies then general practice is not for you uh, that would be more like hospital setting and if you like a lot of adrenaline rush like ane or acute medicine then yes perhaps general practice is not the right thing for you loneliness we work in teams but uh, gp at the end of the day are independent practitioners practicing in their room and you're taking decisions on your own you see a patient it's a 10 minutes consultation you can stretch it to 12 15 minutes if you deem it is appropriate but at the end of the day we have to make a decision we have to sort of justify it in the notes we have to counsel the patients it can be quite daunting and and sometimes people do feel that they are they are on their own and a bit lonely as compared to hospital teams which some people feel are more supported uh, there is robust support there 
responsibility. As I said, that you are seeing the patient, it's a 10 to 12 minutes consultation. Not a lot of diagnostic tools available then and there in general practice uh, if we compare it with hospital. So a lot of responsibility at the end of the day lies on your shoulders to justify what you've done. Um, de-skilled. You, do, you can do a lot of procedures like minor surgery, but yes, if you want to do bigger procedures, as I said, putting the chest drains in, then yes, you would get de-skilled in general practice, and then perhaps it's not for you. Um, only treating coughs and colds, I put a question mark here. If you're only treating coughs and colds, it means you are not diagnosing your uh, patients right. You will pretty much see everything in general practice. I work for six, seven years as a, as a qualified GP, and, and, and anything and everything walks through your door. You are not only treating coughs and colds. Ten patients might come into your room. Eight of them might have minor illnesses like, like an ordinary chest infection or just a viral chest infection, but there'll be one or two that will have something serious and that is the real challenge. You need to pick those two out of those 10 or 20 patients in your surgery. So I'm going to talk a little bit about GP training in the UK. Um, minimum three years speciality training as GPST, like uh, as a GP speciality trainee. You need to maintain a trainee portfolio and clear ARCP, which is the annual review of competence progression each year. Uh, usually at least 18 months in an approved training practice. Uh, sometimes they try and give you the taste of both uh, rural and uh, city practices. Uh, they try and do that. Uh, so you will probably rotate through two different practices. So remaining months in hospitals, um, different specialties, common ones, pediatrics, psychiatry, gynae, ops, a and &E, acute medicine. There are some innovative posts available now uh, where you can split your week between uh, hospital and uh, uh, GP surgeries. We need to achieve MRC GP to successfully complete the training. I think that can be a bit stressful as well because for no other exams in UK as far as, as I know there are limits to attempt it. But for MRC GP there are limited attempts. Uh, CSA, we'll talk about it, can be a bit challenging and you need to clear it to be able to work as GP. Uh, CCT at the end, so we get the certificate of completion of training at the end. So yes, three years pathway. GP ST1, ST1 means speciality training year one. So at six months, there is an educational supervisor report. Obviously, as soon as you start the training, you're maintaining a quite elaborate uh, online portfolio about what you're doing, what you are learning. And at the end of six months, there's a first review, educational supervisor report. Then at 12 months, there is another one, and uh, educational supervisor repo report. And then there is annual review of competence progression. Uh, so this happens throughout the three years, ST1, ST2, and ST3. When you start your ST2, then the window for AKT opens, the first exam for MRCGP, the written exam that is applied knowledge test. You can do it in your second year or third year. And the same with ESR and CRP in uh, ST2. Then ST3, uh, it was CSA, Clinical Skills Assessment, uh, the second part of MRCGP. That was replaced with recorded consultation assessment in ST3 during the pandemic. And it's still ongoing. It is recorded consultation assessment for now. Uh, it's a bit like OSCE, but we used to go to, to, to Royal College in London to do this exam before pandemic, like I did it there. But when, it, when there was pandemic, there was no face-to-face -face contact. So they advise you to do the recorded consultations in your surgeries. It's still ongoing, but will change probably in the next year or so with the more modern exam. So eligibility criteria. Uh, you need to obviously have MBBS or equivalent degree. You should be uh, eligible for full registration and hold license to practice from GMC at the time of intended start date. So you should have evidence of achievement of foundation competency. Foundation com a foundation program is like the house job, it's two years. You need to achieve certain competencies, certain simple procedures. You should have seen certain patients. So you should, these are called the foundation competencies. I'll probably say the same thing that we achieve in, in our house job. So you need to have it in the uh, last three and a half years preceding the start date. At least two years clinical experience by the time you start training. Uh, obviously be eligible to work in UK or and have a UK driving license or equivalent transport agreement. So for application and assessment, uh, there are two rounds each year, uh, February and August start. It's a quite uh, coordinated process by uh, a, a national process uh, through GP National Registration Office. So applications are seen nationally. 
completed through recruitment portal Oriel using an electronic form. If, you, if the candidates meet the eligibility criteria, uh, they are invited to do MSRA, which is a multi-speciality recruitment assessment. It has two papers, a professional dilemma one and a clinical uh, problem solving one. So this is, uh, application is stage one when you're doing this written exam, that is stage two. There used to be a stage three, uh, again like OSCE, when you'll be seeing the patients and an examiner will be assessing you, but that's not been there since the pandemic. Okay, I'm going to briefly whiz through uh, the service delivery in the UK because I've been given a note that my time is up. So contract and funding. The, the way general practices work, uh, the, the practices are contracted and funding is complex, but I'd say it's rather fascinating as well. Um, and it's very different from other parts of the national healthcare system. As I said earlier, GPs are independent, uh, GP surgeries are independent businesses, small to medium sized businesses whose services are contracted by NHS commissioners to provide journalist medical services in a geographical or uh, population area. So what's a GP contract? We'll quickly go through it. Core parts are the geographical and population area the practice will cover. So it's quite clear what area you are covering as a GP practice. Uh, you, you should maintain a list of the patients, establish the essential medical services a practice must provide to its patients, set standards for the premises, workforce and requirements for inspection and oversight, set out expectations for public and patient involvement. Again, like patients are at the heart of what we do in primary care, so we, they should also be participating. There are ways we get the satisfaction questionnaires done, and we have patient participation, patient participation groups to give their feedback. Um, so outline key policies including indemnity, complaints, liability, insurance and clinical governance. In addition to these core agreements, the general practice contract also contains a number of optional agreements. There are certain sort of national requirements and then there are certain local requirements like local enhanced services. If you provide those services as a GP practice, you'll be paid extra sum of money. Funding. Why do I talk so much about funding? Because even if you have goodwill, the energy and the qualification to work, it will dry up after some time. If you're looking after a population of 15 or 20,000 people, you need to maintain certain clinical standards, you need to pay the staff, you need to look after the premises. So you need a, uh, we need a, uh, a, a stream of funding, a constant reliable stream of funding. It's, it's, uh, it's a mix of different income streams. Commissioning responsibility sits formally with NHS England. There, there is role of the local bodies like uh, BMA, British Medical Associations, local medical committees and clinical commissioning groups. So we get the global sum payments. Uh, more than half of the money a practice receives is from global sum money for delivering the core parts of its contract. We've spoken about the contract and uh, the major, the bulk of money is received by providing those services. It is uh, based on an estimate of a practice's patient workload uh, and certain unavoidable costs like if you're working in a rural or remote area. Then we have quality and outcomes framework payments. So 10 to 20% of the practice income. It's a voluntary program, you, uh, practices can join it. Uh, so you'll be looking after patients, for example, with chronic health conditions, and you need to meet certain indicators. And time has shown that GPs or primary care physicians get incentives for that. And at the end of the day, patients get better health outcomes. There are premises payments. There is income by teaching and training stream. And then primary care organization administered payments like locum payments via CCG. So looking at this, we see what is the income in general practice and what are the outgoings. So the income, as I, I described earlier, outgoing includes office costs and IT, uh, clinical consumables like bandages, medicines, ECG machines, papers that we are using in general practice, building costs, rent or mortgage, staffing costs, salaries. Interest, interest and depreciation and then partner income, the income for doctors. So it sounds quite daunting to have your own individual practice or work with a few doctors to run such a, uh, such a big business for, for a few doctors. So there are tools in, in the armory to support individual practices. For example, there, there are local groups, care delivery groups, which have changed to primary care networks now. They consist of six to eight neighboring practices that, that help and support each other. Then there are local medical committees, the local bodies that general practices can contact and get advice. Robust IT system is another thing in our arsenal. Good medical records that provide us good medical records. Uh, Patient-centered care. We join primary and community care to make it more robust, more effective. 
there is emerging concept of polyclinics where there'll be many things under one roof, including pharmacists, opticians, optometrists, district nurses, palliative health care, and general practitioners. Safety systems such as out of hours uh, primary care services. We follow national guidelines, which put us all on one page, NICE or SIGN guidelines. Then there are local guidelines, such as antimicrobial guidelines, due to the resistance to different antibiotics. Uh, then there are regular teaching and training for both medical and non-medical staff members, and will appraisal for qualified GPs, nurses, and non-medical staff. This is it. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zainab. Next presenter is Dr. Abeskin. And as communicated yesterday, now is onward. All the presenters have eight minutes to present, so kindly try to meet the time limit. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, healthy baby needs healthy mothers. Uh, the topic of my research is risk factor associated with low birth weight babies in Pakistan. A systematic review under kind supervision of Professor Dr. Saira Afzal. Uh, this is the learning outline of my uh, systematic review and uh, presentation. Uh, first, we discuss about introduction. Birth weight is most crucial determinant of neonatal and post neonatal survival. Low birth weight babies are more prone to die in first year of life than healthy babies. Uh, globally, out of 145 million live birth, 20 million babies are low birth weight and mostly in developed countries. Prevalence of low birth weight babies is reported as 31% in South Asia, 7% in East Asia, 14% uh, in South Africa and 15% in Middle East Africa. And according to a demographic survey, the prevalence of low birth weight babies in Pakistan is almost 16%. Uh, nearly 15% of babies worldwide are born with a low birth weight. And the objective of my uh, research is uh, to identify the different maternal risk factors that are strongly associated with low birth weight babies. And the operational definition of my systematic review is uh, the set of status of anemia is assessed by setting the value of HB. There are four categories of uh, the level of HB. Uh, severe anemia, when there is a level uh, below 7 gram per deciliter, moderate anemia, 7 gram to 10 gram per deciliter. Mild anemia is 10 to uh, 12 gram per deciliter and the normal is uh, more than 12 gram per deciliter and the definition of low birth weight babies according to WHO is the baby who uh, born with uh, weight less than 2.5 uh, gram at term and the methodology of my systematic review we conduct a systematic literature review including article published between uh, uh, January 2017 to June 2022 to discover and evaluate the different maternal risk factor. The methodology includes a review of relevant published articles found with the help of database like PubMed, Medline, Google Scholar and Park Medinet. In each database the following keywords are used like maternal risk factor, risk factor low birth weight babies, underweight babies, pregnancy risk factor and a PRISMA 2020 uh, flow diagram is used. This is my uh, PRISMA uh, flow sheet in which uh, originally we identify uh, 250 articles, 222 from Google Scholar and 25 from Park Med, uh, uh, PubMed and 3 articles from Park Medinet. And then we apply different uh, criteria over eligibility criteria and the um, at the end uh, we only 20 articles that are uh, uh, included in my uh, systematic review and these all articles are cross-sectional uh, studies and this is the uh, eligibility criteria for my systematic review uh, only cross-sectional cross studies are included and they all are full text article available online and the exclusion criteria uh, we can not we did not include case report case control studies rcts and case studies and paper in other language that did not meet over inclusion criteria are not the uh, part of the study and this is the uh, table of comparison table of my uh, 20 studies in which the author years and the title of the studies place of a study where it is conducted and the study design all studies are cross-sectional and identify a different uh, maternal risk factor and the references of my studies results all the study included in this review were cross-sectional a total 2000 pregnant women are included in analysis 
द इंक्लूडेड स्टडीज रिपोर्ट सैम्पल साइज रेंजिंग फ्राम वन फिफ्टी टू ट्वेंटी एट हंड्रेड टेन ऑल स्टडीज कंडक्टेड इन डिफरेंट सिटीज़ ऑफ पाकिस्तान सेवन वर कंडक्टेड इन कराची थ्री वर कंडक्टेड इन रावल पिंडी एंड द रिमेनिंग स्टडीज कंडक्टेड लाइक वन इन खारियाँ वन इन मुल्तान एंड वन इन हैदराबाद थ्री इन लाहौर वन इन बहावलपुर एंड वन स्टडी इज फ्राम झांग एंड वन इन जाम शोरो दिस इज़ द आउटकम ऑफ माई स्टडी मटरनल एज इज रिपोर्टेड इन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ माई स्टडीज एंड टू एज ग्रुप्स आर आइडेंटिफाई विच आर मोर प्रॉन टू लो बर्थ वेट बेबीज लाइक एज विच आर इन ट्वेंटी वन टू थर्टी ईयर्स एंड बिलो एटीन ईयर्स एंड द मॉडरेट कैटेगरी ऑफ अनीमिया इज स्ट्रॉगली एसोसिएटेड विद लो बर्थ वेट बेबीज एंड द लेवल ऑफ एच बी विच इज एसोसिएटेड इज एट ग्राम टू टेन ग्राम एंड द systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure is also strongly associated with low birth weight babies and the female who are not uh, complete their antenatal visits are associated with low birth weight babies and multiparity is also a risk factor and the females whose bmi is less than 18 or 25 are also associated with low birth weight babies and the, the social income status or also association and the families who have less than 25000 uh, salary uh, per month uh, their babies are mostly low birth weight babies and the education status of mother is also strongly associated which is illiterate and the primary education these are the outcome of my 20 studies and this is shown in the form of pie chart and the discussion in my systematic review there is a maternal age is significant factor for a low birth weight babies and this result was also significant with the secondary analysis of data done which was taken from demography and health service of 10 developed countries and they highlighted that advanced maternal age and the adolescent age group was strongly associated with low birth weight babies and in my systematic review there is also a level of hb is strongly associated with low birth weight babies and this result was also significant with a uh, rct conducted in university of berlin that the moderate anemia in third trimester of pregnancy and a level of hb less than 9 is strongly associated with low birth weight babies and uh, blood pressure is also strongly associated with the low birth weight babies more than 100 diastolic and more than 150 blood pressure is associated with low birth weight babies and the bmi was also associated with the uh, low birth weight babies uh, strength of my systematic review due to strict follow of prisma guideline the current systematic review reported the representative estimate to ease the accessibility of evidence for concerned policy maker the categories of all maternal risk factor which are strongly associated with low birth weight babies are comprehensively reported in this systematic review two authors independently extracted data to lessen probable risk conclusion health professional should screen and consult in pregnant women who are at risk of having infants with low birth weight babies and ensure that women has access to essential health information on the cause of low birth weight babies public education and awareness on how to carry on a healthy pregnancy women should be linked to the appropriate maternal health services including antenatal care and nutritional counseling this is the references of my systematic review and thank you Thank you, Dr. Naida. After the postgraduate residents, now the presenters are our undergraduate students. Next presenter is Dr. Ahmed Hassan. Thank you, Dr. Abbas. Next is Dr. Meha Sadiqi, and again the same request to maintain the time limit. Thank you, Dr. Abbas. Next is Dr. Meha Sadiqi, and again the same request to maintain the time limit. 